You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Television addict! Television addict! Television addict! Ah. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday. It's TV Guidance Counselor. As always, I am Ken Reed. I am very excited to be here today. I am newly refreshed. You might ask yourself why. Uh, reason being, I have just returned from Los Angeles, which I had not really planned on going to this year in January. But thanks to you, the listeners, I went. Uh, the Patreon did much better than I had even imagined. Uh, and it may seem like a small amount. We're making about 100 or $150 a month, something like that, uh, thanks to you. But that was more than enough for me to, to go out and do a couple days jaunt out to Los Angeles and get some great episodes for you. And today is no exception. I'm very excited about this episode today. Had a great time talking to this guest. This is someone who whose work I've admired for years, and it was great to speak to them at length here, and I know that you will enjoy this. I don't just think, I know. Uh, if you hear some oddness in the background, that is my dogs who have very quickly gotten over their excitement to see me after a few days and are now just wrestling with each other as they are wont to do because they are uh, there are three of them and they are large dogs. And so if you hear some odd noises in the background, I am not um, holding Wookiees captive. Uh, there is not uh, uh, some sort of puppet torture going on. That is, in fact, the dogs having having fun. I assure you they're having fun. Anyway, uh, if you're new to the show, my name is Ken Reed. I am a Boston-based stand-up comedian. Uh, at Red on Q, there go the dogs. Uh, I'm a Boston-based stand-up comedian. I've been doing this show for four years now. Uh, four years um, in the next couple weeks. Uh, I think. Uh, I don't think I know. We started on Valentine's Day, 2014. And we're approaching that day, 2018 now. So uh, I'm not great at math, but that would make... Four years. Yep, I did go to public school. Uh, every week someone comes on the show, someone I admire, someone I know, someone who I find interesting. They pick an old issue of TV Guide from my vast collection of TV Guides. We flip through and we use that as uh, the uh, fulcrum to access the memories of our collective television past. And that is uh, what we do today with my guest, the one and only Mr. Matt Nix. Now, Matt, uh, you've seen his name on television, absolutely. He is the creator and showrunner of shows like Burn Notice, The Comedians, uh, The Good Guys, and is currently working on The Gifted, uh, if you're watching that. Matt's a great guy. He's super busy all the time, so I've been trying to get him for a while, and I was lucky enough to get some of his time now. So I'm going to go break up this fight among my dogs. So while I do that, please sit back, relax, and enjoy today's episode of TV Guidance Counselor with my guest, Matt Nix. TV is my friend and it has been always there for me in time with me. How are you, sir? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for trekking up here to the hills and uh, traversing the... I guess it's construction going on outside. Yeah, pretty yeah. minor. It's yeah. all good. Yeah. Not too bad. So I plied you with a, a stack of TV guides here, and you immediately were drawn to this one from 1981, mm -hmm. which I presume was probably the height of sort of... Most people end up picking between like ages 8 and 12-ish. 10. 10. So right in there, because that's when they have their own taste, but can't leave the house, really. That's a very good <laughs> way of putting it. That is exactly right. Yeah. So we watch a lot of stuff. And you were... I think you said you were in Palm Springs at this time? I was, yeah. Uh, sort of... Palm Desert more. Okay. But we lived kind of, I didn't really have any friends around. And so, uh, and I was riding the bus home from school and my parents didn't get home for, I was basically a latchkey kid for, you know, a good two to two and a half hours every day when I got home from school. The best of us were. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically that was, that was like pure unadulterated TV time. And even though like I was a, I was a good student. I was not like a get home and do your homework first student at all. Yeah. So yeah, I was, I, I basically was doing, because it was fascinating looking at it. I was like, oh yeah, I was this block of time. <laughs> and then I had, sometimes I could watch later, but most of my friends were watching like prime time. And I didn't so much watch prime time because my parents would either watch or I'd be doing homework right. or whatever. So I was kind of doing homework when they were home. So yeah, I, I, I was a big, big afternoon block guy and then a 
weekend block guy, but that was mostly cartoons. So it was mostly when you had when you had your own time, basically. Exactly. Are you? Do you have siblings? I had a uh, where I have a sister, um, and we at a certain point when she was old enough, and I'm thinking at that point, yeah, she would have been seven. Okay, so she was definitely coming home on the same bus and watching with me. But I imagine you were in charge of what yes, you were watching. Yes, I yeah. controlled it entirely. Yeah, yes. yeah, which is that three year. My sister was three years younger than me as well. So it was kind of like, yeah, I got the, I got to pick what we watched. And one of the things I always enjoy talking to people about who had siblings and who are, you know, young or pre-millennial TV watchers was there were a lot of times where we had to make a case for our favorite show to, mm-hmm. to like, because there's only one TV. So you're like selling a show to somebody to watch, which is totally lost on people now. Well, actually, it's, it's selling a show. And then the other side of it is making a, an accommodation for a show that is not really your show. You would not have watched it, but you ended up watching a hundred episodes of a show you didn't even like that much. Yeah. And and you came to acquire a taste for it. And sometimes it it's hard for me to explain to my own children, like and I I would just get blank stares. Watch this show that you don't like that much and watch it from beginning to end. <laughs> for two hundred hours. Two hundred hours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just, well, what else are you gonna do? Not watch TV? Yeah, you can't it's not that. That's crazy. Yeah. Man, what, what Is there about? a specific show you can think of like that for you? I this is, I know it's heretical. I did not much like the Brady Bunch, but I watched all of the Brady Bunch. I would say that's true of me as well. Part of it was, you know, the I didn't really think that that the kids on the Brady Bunch would be friends with me. They weren't my people particularly. And I think that was one of the early things where I kind of saw the formula. I saw what they were doing. And... That said, though, it was a point of connection for me and friends of mine because, like, they, there were, I had a lot of friends, like everybody did at that time, who were really into the Brady Bunch. And I was sort of like, okay, well, I can participate. It's that shared experience. Yeah. Yeah. And there were so many, you know, one of the things I also love is that for people could be completely different as adults. But if you go back far enough, you could be arguing about politics or whatever, but you're like, oh my nose. And they're like, oh my God, what about Cousin Oliver? And all of a sudden you have this shared experience, regardless of how you grew up up and that's something sort of lost now yeah um and i, I one of my friends I, I asked her like what a what do kids have now as a shared experience and she was like natural disasters yeah <laughs> and i was like kind of <laughs> and we all had like and then they get the tiki idol and vincent price shows up like <laughs> y- even if you didn't like it you knew about it well and, and actually that's a that's a really interesting point because even things that we think of as Here's this massive cultural phenomenon. Everybody watches Game of Thrones. But no. Oh, God, no. No, not at all. And, and you know, for me, like, my mind immediately went to Stranger Things for my kids. But there's a huge swath of this country that would be like, I wouldn't even consider watching Stranger yeah. Things. Yeah, I don't even know what Netflix is. Yeah, that's, it's, yeah. uh, and so like a massive shared experience is really just like a massive shared experience because it overlaps several tribes. Two niches. Yeah, two yeah. niches. Yeah. yeah. It's just like, all right, well. Well, and- the number one show now, ratings-wise, wouldn't have cracked the top 100 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah. I actually, I, I, years ago, I was playing poker with one of the producers or like the guy, who, the the main producer of Cagney and Lacey, because okay. he was married to um, to Sharon Glass, and we were playing poker, and I was like, I gave him some shit, and he, <laughs> I love him for this. Like he looked at me and he was like, "Bitch, talk to me when your show gets a sixty share," and I was yeah. like, "Fair enough, you win." I, I yeah, that's sixty percent of the country. Yeah, is watching that show. <laughs> <laughs> like that's yeah. nuts. There like, you go. In in growing up, you kind of in addition to sort of stumbling on things or watching things you didn't like, there was also sort of a pressure to have the cultural capital to talk to kids at school about stuff. Because yeah. what else are you going to talk about? You're 10. Uh-huh. You're going to talk about what happened on TV. So, like, I never liked Happy Days, but I would watch it because kids would talk about it. I, or, same thing. you know, Perfect Strangers or shows that I was like, I don't really care for it, but someone's going to bring it up and I kind of have to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the big thing when I was 10 was Knight Rider, which was not in this TV guide, but... My best friend was super into Knight Rider. That was like the first time it was sort of like, schedule it. You're watching it. I must have the television, yep. mom and dad. Knight Rider is happening. Although I can remember like where I was sitting. 
when Knight Rider had the laser seat belts. Yes. And I was like, no, <laughs> there's no reason. Even then, I didn't, I didn't have the words for it, but I was like, there's just a fiber optic cable. Like, that's yeah. just an effect you can do. Laser seatbelts would cut people in half. Lasers don't make things stronger. It's not better to have that. Yeah. yeah. Why are you doing this, yeah. Knight Rider? I, I You're thought Kit was real, and now he can't be. He's endangering Michael doing that. <laughs> this is irresponsible. And your friends are like, man, that looks awesome. Laser seatbelts, yeah. yeah. And, I, and, and that was a moment for me where I just, I was like, I'm going to have to bite my tongue. And actually, looking through this, the, the one, there were a couple that really stood out for me. One was MASH. Because I was not just watching, I was watching MASH. And then another episode of MASH. Because it did an hour. Sometimes another episode of MASH. Because I could also switch channels to the local channel, which had it in syndication. Yep. And so I watched I every episode backwards and forwards, knew it like the back of my hand. And when it was finally done, I cried at yeah. school. And my my I remember my my good friend Patrick putting his hand on me. And being like, it's okay. Like, it's going to be in syndication for years. And, like, they're going to... There will be other shows. And I was just like, oh, but it's it's gone. I... This will will make you feel better about that. I loved Family Ties so much. And the last episode, I was 10. I was inconsolable. Mm -hmm. And they came out and they did the curtain call and everything. And I actually stayed home sick from school the next day. Because I was so devastated. But it's... When I think about it... I'd been watching that show for 80% of my life. 80% so you feel like you knew those people. And I actually read uh, a clinical medical study somebody did where they said when a show ends or gets canceled, people go through biologically the stages of grief. Oh, yeah. And they actually were able to show it chemically in the brain that people have literally the same reaction. And it's, it, I was like, yeah, like that's kind of what I felt at, as a kid, especially where as a kid, you're not as, not that you ever get used to death or people dying or that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. But as an adult, it's easier to, the older you get, the, the more a part of life it is. So things ending, uh, but yeah, it's, it's devastating. Not, it's not the same <clears throat> feeling of like, I live in a world that is permanent and yeah. eternal. Oh, wait a second. It isn't right. And that's, yeah, it's a big thing. I actually, there, uh, I, not sure how frank I should be here, but like <laughs> the other weird thing going into TV myself is there are certain people that I grew up on or, you know, that I, and I have a really emotional attachment to them. And there's one lead actor in MASH who I was just like very attached to as a sort of model of decency yeah. and sort of moral struggle and, and that kind of thing. And I, uh, and because even as a kid, I, I I liked Mash more when it got more dramatic and and that kind of thing in the later years. And uh, but then, you know, I, I explored hiring that actor at one point, and I actually had to look the person that I the casting person that I was talking to in the eye and say, "This is who this person is for me. Do I want to hire?" this person or not will this will, will this, don't meet your hero yeah exactly yeah. and she was like i think maybe it's best that you don't don't yeah like and and we didn't get into much more detail she basically was like not horrible but just nah, you don't want to do that yeah right yeah and i was like thank you very much because i that is that is too precious to me I just, we're going to leave that one there where it is. I bet most people wouldn't have that foresight to ask that question though. Oh, but I've been burnt. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I've, I've had the experience of just realizing that someone that I lionized and I, and, and then you meet them and, and sometimes it's not like, oftentimes it's not horrible. It's just yeah. disappointing or, or it shatters an illusion and you just didn't want it shattered. And then there have been other cases where, People will be like, "Oh no, this person's fantastic! You're gonna love him, and it'll and, and it'll just reinforce everything you loved about yeah. them." And so Bruce Campbell, perfect oh, example. Oh yeah, he's amazing. Where I was just like, uh, and I actually I was not careful with my heart there. Um, I was just like, Bruce Campbell sold, yes, absolutely, yep. Bruce Campbell. And then I got on the phone with him, and I was like, "Oh, this is even better than I thought, yeah. Bruce Campbell, f- fantastic." But that was uh, so I've had great experiences with it. Yeah, and Bruce, 
is so good at being Bruce. He's always him. Yeah. Like I, the last time he was in Boston, I I was talking to him to be on the show, and he called me. And the the quote from him, he's like, it was the most Bruce Campbell quote ever. He was like, uh, my dance card's pretty full in Boston, uh, but we'll do this, brother. <laughs> and I was like, that is what Bruce Campbell would say. Yeah. And it was like Absolutely. too perfect. Yeah, no, he's he's uh, he's great that way. So. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it was so, I'm sure you hear this all the time on this podcast, but I just, it was really fascinating to me going over this list as someone who, and I'm sure you've heard this before. It didn't, I didn't think of myself as a huge TV viewer growing up. And yet I, <laughs> there's a lot of things on that list. <laughs> oh my God. A lot of things on this list. And I remember watching them a lot. And then the other thing is just as we're talking about like the passion for yeah. it, like the, and I, I can remember being in Palm Springs and I was standing in the pool and someone, my parents were talking to someone and they mentioned that some, the son of someone they knew had written a spec episode of WKRP in Cincinnati. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and they were trying to get hired. The guy lived in LA. I mean, you know, so, yeah. and, uh, they're just having this conversation and I can remember it like it is a painting. I was like, wait, what? There is a thing <laughs> called, you could just write you an can episode? Do that? Oh my God. No one asked you to? Yes, it was just, and it blew my mind. And I think I spent the rest of the afternoon being like, so what's it about? <laughs> yeah. When's it going to be on? How does this work? What's the deal? And then when I was in high school, I had this weird experience where, again, like, even in high school, I was still watching a lot of TV. And a friend of mine's dad came to speak to our video production class. And he was a TV writer. And he spoke. And they were like, does anybody have any questions? And I had all the questions. Right? <laughs> I've written them down here. There. And then, like, as he was trying to leave, I went lunch. And I just sort of, like, cut him off. And I spent all of lunch. I, I don't even think I ate that day. Just <laughs> interrogating him on everything. Now, the funny thing about all this is I did not know that I wanted to write television. So I talked to that guy. Years later, I am running a television show. It is literally like 15 years later. And my friend contacts me because her dad has a thing that, that this guy that came and spoke has yeah, yeah. a thing he wanted to ask me about. And she tells me the story. And I realized that for him, he was like, oh, yeah, I met that kid who wanted to be a TV writer, and he's a TV writer. It makes perfect sense for yeah. him. Whereas for me, I was like, oh, I'll be a doctor or a lawyer. Yeah, but I'm all just these curious. Things. I'm just curious. This is just a thing. And he was like, he just saw it. And he was like, oh, yes, TV writer. This, yeah. this will absolutely happen. And he was totally right. That's your but only I had path. no idea. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's sometimes that stuff finds you. It's yeah. just like whatever it clicks with you. Like, I I... There's a few things that I've always loved and I don't remember when I first saw them or like first became interested. TV being one of them. Like I was, a, I read early and I would get the TV guide every week when I was two, three years old and go through and I would read about shows I didn't watch because I was like, there's two shows on at the same time. Well, at least reading it, I'll know what happened, you know? <laughs> oh so it was God. like, I can do that. Or like, I remember I, uh, my dad, when my, my parents split up and my, my dad was moving stuff. This was a few years ago. And he goes, uh, I found your uh, Sid Caesar autograph. And I was like, what's Sid Caesar autograph? And he goes, you remember that? And I don't know. And he goes, when you were two, you found out somehow that Sid Caesar was doing a play in Framingham Mass at some dinner theater. And you harassed us nonstop to go meet Sid Caesar. As a two-year-old? As a two-year-old. And they took me. And I had this autograph from Sid Caesar with a date and a photo. That's and I'm insane. like, what a weird, like a two-year-old asking me to do anything right now other than like, can I have a sandwich? You're like <laughs> the most like, useless savant. Yeah, ever. it's totally unnecessarily like, I got to go meet Sid Caesar. So it's, it's, that stuff's just there, I guess. And like I, Spencer for Hire is one of my favorite shows. Yeah. And, um, that was one of the few shows they shot in Boston mm. and they really shot it and we could go and watch them film it. And that was the greatest thing on earth to me. Yeah. And I would go and beg my parents for, from 80, you know, five years old to eight years old. Can we go in and watch them shoot Spencer for hire? You know, and then I would just take the train in with anyone who would take me. That's awesome. <laughs> and so it's, it's weird how kids just latch onto that stuff. For I actually, reason. it's funny that you mentioned that because I had this, kind of like mildly important experience for me when I was doing, uh, I was doing APB, um, in Chicago 
last year. And I was driving through, you know, we were driving through our set. I, we weren't stopping, but I, I was in this van and I looked over and we're in a really poor area of Chicago and it's, you know, by train tracks and sort of right. run down, yeah. whatever. And I see these kids, like a couple kids standing on the side of the road and they're watching and I see how they're watching. They, they're not like, you know, Oh, TV show, whatever, you know, yeah. like they are watching. Yeah. They're trying to learn. And I, and I had this instinct that I didn't go with, but I regret it. And I think about it frequently. And I vowed in my life in the future, I will always stop because I just recognized it's like these two clearly poor African American kids living in South side Chicago and I just, I looked out, the, and they were probably like 13, and I looked out the window, and I was I was just like, oh, I recognize you, brother. You're a TV writer. You're, you're a nerd. Like, you're, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're, you're one of us. Like, yeah. And I just, and if I if I could go back in time, I wanted to just jump out of the out of the van and be like, hey, no, you could do this too. Yeah. You're one of us. It's fine. Yeah. It transcends, like, it transcends class and yeah. gender. You'll get out everything. of here. Yeah, yeah, it's so good. Like, this is the best thing that ever happened to you. Yeah. Just stick with this. Uh, like I'll give you some names. Here's a school to go to. Yeah, and and we're gonna we're gonna make this happen because yeah. like I see you. you yeah, know? I mean that's good. Like that's that's a. Am- I'm so glad you have that instinct because it's even just seeing that stuff. Like growing up in Boston, which seemed a million miles away from anything exciting, anything that wasn't sports. Um, having a, a show on a network, film there, mm-hmm. it made you go. You can do that. And it, it's, it's really weird to have that. It sounds so simple, but, and I'm sure even just those kids seeing that was, you know, has that effect on those certain people. Yeah. Making something possible. I, it's actually like, I, I, my great grandfather was a screenwriter in for like the silent films oh, in the wow. beginning. And he was, he was nominated for an Academy Award for Sergeant York. Okay. And he wrote for Frank Capra and stuff. I never met him. Like he died so long before I was born. Right. And, then my great uncle, who's now 95, was a child actor in like the 40s. Wow. Right? Or the 30s and 40s. Jackie right? Coogan era. Yeah. And so, like, I can, you can see him in old movies playing like gang number number, <laughs> gang member number seven, wearing a sweater and saying, well, I think we ought to sock him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, and, uh, and my great aunt, my, my sister is named after my great aunt. And so was my daughter. And she was the publicist for, she was a big publicist at MGM in, wow. in, in like the, the late thirties, forties, fifties. And then was there like the day the studio system collapsed wow. and just gave, was like giving actors, emotional actors rides out of the studio. Yeah. Huge stars. Their world right? had collapsed completely. Yeah. She had a story about like, taking care of this young actress who was sort of a mess, you know, and like just, uh, and when she was working at the studio and I realized like, she didn't even mention it, but like, I realized three quarters of the way in the story, she's talking about Angela Lansbury. (laughs) And, uh, so she was, uh, but at, when I, when she, when I was a kid, she was, um, Tom Selleck's publicist, Sam Elliott's publicist. Now the thing about it is she was old school, right? She was like from the era, her best friend, was responsible for like 30 years of rock Hudson isn't gay. Right. Wow. (laughs) So like that. So she was really hardcore. She never told tales out of school. And so I, the only thing I knew was that she was in the business, right? She talked about Tom for years and I thought she had a coworker named Tom. I did not know that her coworker was Tom Selleck from Magnum PI. Yeah. <laughs> there was no right. glam. It was just matter of fact. Matter of fact. And, but also just, she was incredibly protective. My favorite story about her was when, when the thing about, um, Mad Max. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Sugar Tits. Uh, yes, yeah. When, when that all <laughs> um, came out. Yeah. Um, uh, the actor's name. Uh, I'm blanking. Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson. Yes, sorry. When Mel Gibson came out. I had lunch with her the next day, and she was like, oh, dear, have you heard about this Mel Gibson thing? And she's old. She's like yeah. 79, right? And uh, I was like, yeah, what do you think? And she's like, it's just disgusting. In my day, every single bartender in Malibu would have been paid off. <laughs> These people are businesses. There is no reason that a star like that should yeah. walk into a bar and be allowed to behave like that. How much does it cost 
to to keep how much, him in check. Yeah, to keep him in check. You just you you tell them like there's a thousand dollars in it for you if you make a phone call about our star. Like this should not happen. And I was yeah. like, ah, yeah, they see a strong feeling. <laughs> but the 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 point for me was just that the only thing I had. They, they were all out of the business except my great aunt who couldn't really do anything because she's a publicist. But the one thing I had was it was possible. Yeah. Right. So there was like this very thin line from my family to this thing that I loved. And they couldn't like tell me what steps to take or whatever, but they could say like, this, this is a thing so that when I finally decided to do it, my family two generations back was like, Screenwriter? Terrific. That's Got a real job. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's fantastic. <laughs> right. So, so your parents weren't, didn't have to necessarily be like, what's your backup when this doesn't work? Because they were really worried about thing. me that I was going to be a lawyer and they were just like not supportive at all. They were just like, oh, <laughs> my dad was like, you've never talked about law. Like you <laughs> don't care about law. I don't really buy it. And uh, it's going to cost a lot of money to go to all that school. Yeah. And just- well, he was like, I'll support you if you can find a lawyer who's doing something that you care about. But I, yeah. I, I'm not going to support you just because you, you don't know what to do. And uh, and then I was like screenwriting. And my mom's like, here are all the screenwriting books. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll be your editor. It's, yeah. you know, so it's great. Figure Gonna do it, yeah, do it. Do it. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing, and and that that is just having the ability to go. This is something someone could make their living at. Yes, um, is is huge because that I think is maybe less now because people it, it, things seem more accessible now to everybody probably in some ways. But I still think it's important to. I mean, the essence of your podcast is the the passion that we felt for these things yeah right like and the and i think about like star trek like i watched all the original star treks i was so into star trek and if you are the sort of person who would fight someone (laughs) over like who could really work work up an argument yeah right about like that is a that is the best episode yeah clearly right city on the edge of forever yeah is Star Trek. Yeah, that is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. And if you are that person, I think that I think it's important to understand like I think it's easier now to go like okay, everything's more accessible. Yes, we know more about the behind the scenes of Hollywood and things right. like all of those things are true. But I think more important than that is that connection when because I'll have people come to me like young writers or you know people like that and and it's so exciting to me when I find someone um, in in any field like even like a grip or right. anything where I'm just like oh you're gonna love it it's you're yeah. it's this is totally your thing you're gonna love it because you know if it's crew it's like yeah you liked camp and you like hanging out with people <laughs> this is your thing you're, it's gonna be great but it's the, the the flip side of that is sometimes I will meet people who want to do it. And I'm like, oh, you think you care about this enough, but you have to understand, like, you're going up against people, like, you're going up against people who care about this so much more than you do. And you don't even understand what you don't have because, like, you never fought anybody over a TV show. You're just like, oh, this is like a a good idea I have or whatever. I've actually said this to people where I'll just be like, okay, you, you have to understand I want to write all the shows. Yeah. <laughs> Everything. I want, it, like, that show, if, if somebody tells me we need a show like this, like, uh, my mind automatically starts work, working on it because I'm just like, yes, must make all That's a shows. great idea. Way to do this. We're going to yeah. do this. Right. Yeah. And, and, and so I'm, I'm like, okay, you think you're competing against the younger version of me or whatever. You're competing. You're still competing with me. Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, I'm yeah. still here. Like, I'm going to try to take your job. And if you can take my job... My response to that is awesome. Can we have lunch so that I can eat your heart and steal your power? Right. Like right. I, I want to know what you do so that I can take it apart right. and then I can do that too because that because I you know I I just loved all of these right. things. You have that drive. You will fight for that stuff even if you don't have to. Right. You need to. Yes. Um. And that's you know I, I, I'm kind of when I try to explain to people sometimes. Like, I'll be complaining about I have to go do a stand-up gig. And I'm like, ugh. I'm like, why do you do it? And I'm like, it's it's like being a werewolf. <laughs> You're like, I'm going to change. Lock me up. Lock me up. It's happening. Uh, and then you just lean into it once it's happening. Right. But then the next time you're like, ugh, why did I do it? It's almost like 
you know, it's just there. It's, it's, you're compulsed to do it, compelled but to do it. I'd say, I think that's really insightful. And I think part, part of what's important about that is most jobs like stand up, like television writing, like acting, where people, where the experience, there's a sort of glorious transcendent experience at the core of it. The stuff that surrounds it is a huge pain in the ass. Oh, yeah. It's so much worse than, I don't know, being a house painter. Because being a house painter, like, if you like being a house painter, you're probably going to like most of it. Yeah. There's right? peaks and valleys with this instead of just a plateau. Exactly. And so, so if you decide to go into, like, a, a, a career like, you know, TV writing or producing or acting or stand-up or whatever, you're basically just saying, like, I value the peaks more than I hate the valleys. And... And the sort of steady as you go, kind of even. Yeah, it's all right. Like it doesn't. It's not interesting to me. But that's why I, I'm always ambivalent when people say like, if there's anything else you can do, do it because it's so terrible. And I'm like, right. actually, my my hero is Stephen J. Cannell. Yes. And he did a great podcast uh, for USC's uh, School of uh, Cinema, and. Uh, he talks about how he hates when people say, do anything else. And and his thing is basically like, no, do this. Yeah. It's the best thing. It is truly like there's nothing better. You just have to love it enough to put up with all of the stuff that goes along with it. But if you right. can, if, if this is really what you want to do, do it right now. Yeah. It's the best thing, right? It's just that the, you know, for me, it's like, okay, well, I, that little kid, who was watching, who watched all the episodes of WKRP in Cincinnati, couldn't believe that the thing, wanted to write his own right. episode of WKRP. Somebody writes yeah, it. Like, yeah. we're going to do this. Like, that is the reason that I can stay up all night and bang out a script in 17 hours with a gun to my head because we lost a location and, you know, like, or whatever it is. Yeah. It's, it's because I still have that connection to, you know, the kid who was like, I'm on my fourth episode of MASH tonight <laughs> yep. and we're going to keep going. It's not time to make the donuts for you. Yeah. It's, it's, you're a chef, um, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're a passionate, like, that's the other, I, I think I might get a record for analogies about stand up today, but I always explain it to people as like being a chef. You created the recipe, but you have to recreate that every night. And then someone eats it and it's gone. Mm -hmm. And the next day you start over again versus being like a short order cook where you're like, yeah, whatever you want. And I did the thing and then I move on and it's kind of an assembly line where it's like, this is what I do. And it's not sometimes it feels like the needle doesn't move at all and you're constantly redoing right. it, but you like the result so much that you'll still do it. Yeah. And it becomes more about the doing of the thing, right? Because it's the, it's yeah, because Stand up a certain kind that you can't hang it on a wall, a certain kind of disposable art. Right. And television was that way. Yeah, it was that way. <clears throat> to some extent, it still is in the sense that, you know, like it can kind of hang on the wall. But, but even there, like as much as people talk about how now everything's on a streaming service and you can see it whenever and all of the, all of those things are true. However, no one now has to watch like a show in syndication over and over right. and over people's thing is basically like i'm gonna binge watch every episode of the shield and then i'm done I, yeah. I i did it right and you might watch it again but that's more and more rare yeah or you know one of the things i always talk about too is that like one of the reasons that and i think we're probably wired weirdly to be so passionate about this stuff but when we we're watching tv we didn't know if we'd ever see that again. Right. So we sat there and we watched wide eyed and absorbed everything. And it's the same way with, you know, music where I'm like, a lot of the albums I bought that people recommended to me or I read, I hated. Mm -hmm. First time I was doing, I hated it. But because I spent money on it and because someone recommended it to me, I sat there and I listened to it again and I listened to it again. And then it hit me. And those are my favorite things now. Mm -hmm. And because you were invested in it. And now with streaming and stuff, people can watch two minutes and go, nope, next, 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 next. And it, it, I think it robs people of a lot of things that they'd actually really like. Like MASH, you know, you're 10 years old and here's a show about the Korean War. Yeah. Like, 
you're on paper that doesn't make any sense you might watch hogan's heroes you know but mash doesn't or, or barney miller is a good example to me i love barney miller barney miller to me is the purest writer's show ever it's five guys in a room talking for 200 episodes and there's never been an episode i didn't love yeah. <laughs> and it's perfect yeah and, but i was watching barney barney miller as yeah. a little kid like i i can't imagine selling barney miller to my children it's cops doing paperwork yeah kids don't want to watch that is there anything you've tried to show your kids that you loved as a kid that they're just like uh no oh that's a good question i i i haven't really gone after oh well um <laughs> I showed my kids the original Blade Runner. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> slow. The, yeah. Um, uh, my oldest was sort of like, I get it. It's, you know, uh, he's 15 and he was like, it's, it's beautiful. Um, and, uh, but my daughter made up a song called Blade Runner is hard to follow. <laughs> <laughs> it's not wrong. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, the, yeah, I mean, we've done, we've done a number of, but uh, the, the truth is like, at the moment, I'm still in the phase of showing them the sure fires right. right at the right time. And so, yeah, like I showed my oldest Goodfellas and he was like, that is the best thing in the world. And yeah. I was like, yes, it is the best thing in the world. You're right. Um, and then he watched Wolf of Wall Street and was like, that is also the best thing in the world. And I was like, that is not the best <laughs> no, thing No, it isn't. You're, you're only <laughs> half right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But I imagine there's stuff that you're like, this is a sure fire. And then the kids go, no, it isn't. Yes. Yes. Or and even you might go. Oh, actually, it isn't. <laughs> well, that actually, frankly, Blade Runner was a bit of, that was a bit of my reaction to Blade Runner because I'm sort of sitting back and I'm, I'm looking at, like, storytelling is so much faster now. Oh, yeah. Right? And there's so many things that, um, actually, another one for me was years ago, I sat down to watch an episode of Starsky and Hutch, <laughs> which wasn't, I, I watched Starsky and Hutch as a kid because my cousin, who I spent a fair amount of time with, um, was a huge Starsky and Hutch fan. I think kind of because he was blonde and had the right haircut. <laughs> right. Kind of, he was, he wanted that car. The show. Yeah. He was a big car guy. And so it wasn't really my show growing up, but I did watch it. And then, but then I watched it again. And I, and, and as someone who does shows with action and that kind of thing, I'm like, no, guys, like, I know that they, they got to the warehouse by getting out of the car and walking right. into the warehouse. We don't need to no see need. that. Yeah, exactly. And, and the, the shows were just so thin. There was n like nothing happened. And yet at the time we were just like, Oh God, it's nonstop like action. Packed. Man, yeah. TJ Hooker jumped on the hood of the car. Yeah. And then there was 50 minutes of nothing. Yeah. yeah. I actually, Dukes <laughs> of Hazard. The one, my parents were very liberal in, in uh, their TV rules, right? They would let me watch. They wouldn't, I could not watch soap operas. Okay, fair. I couldn't watch in the middle of the day unless I was sick. Okay. Right? But beyond that. was game that, shows anyway. <laughs> yeah, beyond that, it was pretty much whatever you want, with the exception of Dukes of Hazard, because my mom was like, uh, it's stupid, right? And she just yeah. objected to it. <laughs> and... And so it became sort of a guilty pleasure for me. I would sneak it when I could. But even there, I was like, and now when I watch it, right, and I don't like sit down to watch it much, but now having produced a lot of action television, I'm like, God, it's so lazy. It's the same jump. Yeah. Like you're doing the same stunt over and over. It might and over. even be the same footage yeah, over and over again. Just like yeah. you're cycling it out. Yeah. And, and it was so frustrating first, to me. The first time that hit me as a kid, I loved both V miniseries. Mm -hmm. Those were perfect. Even the second one. And I was four or something when it started airing. And even then I picked up on the sort of fascist Nazi allegory, yeah. which um, I, I read a great interview with Ken Johnson later. Mm -hmm. And he claims that he pitched it as a straight fascist takeover the United States. And they said no. And then in the room he went, they're aliens. And they went, perfect. Oh, <laughs> so wow. he just... Pulled that out of there. Really? And uh, I don't know how true that is, but it makes sense to me. And they did an ongoing series that was god-awful. Yeah. And part of the reason was they reused all the big effect shots from the miniseries. Oh. And I don't know exactly technically why this happened, but every time they used it, it 
degraded. So by like episode 15, it was like dirty and dark and really looked super shitty too. Oh, no. So it was extra obvious. So even as a kid, I was like, what are they? This is garbage. Like, this is so stupid. And now, you know, this episode all takes place in a cave because they have no money. <laughs> and so it was that kind of thing where you're like, why? Don't do this. Cheap and out on yeah, me. Don't yeah. do this. <laughs> yeah. Actually, V was um, a little bit later than the time period we're talking about, but Man, I I remember watching that and just being. I remember having the thought, "This is so exciting! It's obviously dystopian. Clearly, the aliens are bad. Like, I totally get it. I'd still trade it all for aliens. Which I, it's fine. You yeah. know what I mean? Okay, they can eat us all. It's fine. It'd be pretty exciting. Steal the water. Well, Diana was pretty sexy. Yeah. She ate that hamster. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So into it. It's. Uh, Have you like, clearly you have an affinity for sci-fi stuff, mm-hmm. and The Gifted falls into that. But it, had you ever tried to do shows like that before? Um, I have. I've sold a couple things that are in that arena. It's definitely something that I'd like to do. It's one thing I'm conscious of is like my appetite, like the gifted is operating at the limits of what a network television show can do in terms of like time and budget and effects and all of these things. And, uh, and, but my appetite for that stuff is just enormous. You know what I mean? Like I want to do all of the things. Right. And so, and I, I'm a big, I like, I like, reading sci-fi i like thinking about it like all of these things so there's also part of me that's like i've got to do the best thing i can't right. can't you know, compromise I can't on compromise. it yeah. i can't do like a half-assed i can't do v I can't, yeah <laughs> the series and yeah. so yeah i can't do v the series exactly and 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 i think that there's actually a thing in sci-fi that that there's a reason that sci-fi ends up like long-lived sci-fi mm-hmm. often ends up being like Here's a cast of characters in a situation that allows us to comment on present day uh, circumstances or uh, or social issues. Yeah, it's always allegory. It's, it's always allegory, right? But sci-fi as a genre in movies and in books is not necessarily allegory. It's usually the working out of an idea and the implications of an idea, and so. I really like that kind of sci-fi and that kind of sci-fi is extraordinarily difficult to do on television. And so like I'm a huge Black Mirror fan because Black Mirror is one of the few like straight up sci-fi shows um, that have ever existed. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And, And I'd say like the gifted, I love doing the gifted and it certainly has sci-fi elements, and we are we we do some of that working out of ideas, but we're doing a lot of allegory, right? Right, and and the nerd in me, like I know that I have to stay away from, you know, let's explore the physics implications right. of the these tech things. here. So yeah, I stuff. can't actually get into that, <clears throat> which you could with Bird Notice, weirdly. Yeah, yeah, and and, and that's the thing I I like. Burn Notice was very much an opportunity to to exercise some of those muscles because I would I would like the the kid in me that always wanted to know how everything worked and right. everything like that like and and also just the opportunity as a kid I there was a part of me that wanted to be like a half ass inventor I yeah. wanted to be an inventor but I yeah. didn't want to do any of the work of like actually yeah testing the circuits or you just want to be Tesla at the end of his life exactly I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. I'm just like okay I thought of it make it yeah right. And, oh, and, great, <laughs> and, and and the wonderful thing about Burn Notice was just like our kind of rule for all the science was, or the all the the tech and the, the the things they did was, if it is theoretically possible, right? If it can be done, it is accomplished in its conception, right? right? So we 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 know that this is a possibility. This is a thing that can be made, and we held ourselves to. I would argue considerably higher standards than like classic MacGyver, which was where it was sort of like, yeah, really far fetched. Really pushing that. Yeah. Yeah. Like the physics really doesn't work. Right. Right. But we did one thing on burn notice once where, and this is so dorky to bring up, like (laughs) where we had a magnet that did not 
operate using the inverse square law. Like okay. it just was like, there's a way the magnets work and our yeah. magnet did not work not that, work way. that way. And, and we kind of discovered it through the doing of it. And we were like, Oh, wait a second. Magnets don't work this way at all. Like the, the, the power of the magnet falls off way too quickly for this ever to work. And I will always hate that scene. <laughs> And because we were way too far down the road. There was right. no other way to get, we, we had to do it. Has anyone ever brought that up to you? Uh, yes. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. And I, I mean, not, not a lot, but it's basically, cause it was a, people have noticed. It was a throwaway thing. Yeah. And, uh, but it was just like, yeah. And I, I, I'm like, uh, it, it bums me out because yeah. I just like, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Well, you guys. care. Yeah. I think yeah. that's the thing about that passion. Like you're going to make the argument uh, about why that's a problem and other people are going to go, no one will notice. So they're not going to notice. But like, I, that's one of the reasons I love David Cronenberg movies mm -hmm. because all of his sort of speculative body horror stuff sounds plausible. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, we've, grafted a parasite into your body that has, does the function of your liver and cleans your blood and it takes a little and I'm like, well, it sounds like it would work. Yeah. And then it goes wrong, you know? Uh, and, and to your point about sci-fi, like pure sci-fi, it's true. Like when I think sci-fi channel did childhood's end mm -hmm. and people kind of hated it. And I'm like, that's a pure sci-fi story in a lot of ways. It's not really action oriented. It's, and people hated it. And I'm like, I realized that in visual mediums, Sci-fi needs to be grafted onto another genre yes. for people to buy it. And the alien movies being the best example. So the first one's a haunted house movie. The second one's a war movie. The third one's a prison movie. Like none of them are a sci-fi movie. Yeah. And there's no idea yeah. in it. It's, I mean, I love. They're great. Uh, yeah, they're, yeah. They're fantastic movies. But as you say, they are, they are, you know, a, a horror movie, a war movie. And that, and I, I, so my favorite sci-fi short story of all time is stories of your life, which got made into, um, arrival. Mm -hmm. And that is, it, it is like the hardest core sci-fi as a short story, as a movie, it's a love story and it's, a you know, parents and yeah. parents and all of those things. And it, it, and that, so I think that that's kind of as close as you can get, um, to like really hard sci-fi in movies. Um, and that, so yeah, that's, it's something that I've thought a lot about, but one of the problems, I think, if you sit down to do it and it's why the, have you seen the current season of uh, Black Mirror? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's why it made me so nervous when they linked all the episodes together into a common timeline. It's why I hope they will go away from that because the problem is, as I see it, you know, you, you have an idea in sci-fi and then you work out the implications of the idea. And it's basically some version of like, okay, and this is good, or this is bad, or this is ironic, or this is, you know, this, this sheds some light on right. our, our current society or whatever it is. But if you try to do a TV series like that, then the idea, you will have worked out the implications of the idea, you know, a certain number of episodes in. And as much as I like this season of Black Mirror, it did recycle some essential technological ideas. There's right? too many MacGuffins. They yeah. sort of cancel each other out after a while. Well, or... but also the, the idea of eternal tor virtual eternal torture. Right. Right. Okay. Virtual eternal torture. When it first came up, it was awesome. Right. Really interesting. And now we're doing other versions of virtual eternal torture. And yes, there are separate implications of different versions of virtual eternal torture, but it's not a new idea. Now, I am saying this about a show that I love, and I would recommend episodes to people that are recycling this idea, but I watch it and I'm like, okay, you will not be a hard sci-fi Like, you're going to end up, if you keep going down this road, guys, you're going to end up having worked out all of the implications of this idea. You're going to be done with it. And you don't have characters with, like, human relationships and everything. Right. You, there, you're, it's built around the idea. It's built around the idea. You're not going to be able to go for the change up, which... Most sci-fi shows, like, you can introduce an element of a sci-fi idea in, you know... And that's and actually one thing uh, along those lines. Another thing that I thought uh, I was talking to a, a writer, I forget his name from uh, Star Trek. Uh, I think it was Star Trek next gen, but they were talking about how um, basically the Star Trek show, uh, Star Trek and, and it's ilk had laid waste to the sci-fi 
landscape because they cannibalized so many central ideas. And so you just end up with like, uh, you know, like, you know, you take microcosmic God, that <clears throat> right. famous short story that's been done as a Simpsons episode and as a South Park episode and in other forms. Well, I think it was the Sand Kings. They did it later in um, the mm-hmm. new Outer Limits. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's just it's a it, there's a really cool idea, an amazing short story. Yeah. And but like everybody's going to they're, they're going to glom onto it and they're going to use it and, and that kind of thing. And so and I love those episodes, but. It loses the power. The more you times you, it's like a photocopy. Yeah. It gets it gets lesser and lesser. Like I am Legend, which I still contend is a sci fi book, mm-hmm. uh, it was one of my favorite books ever. And every adaption has missed the science part of it. Mm-hmm. And that was always my favorite part of that book when he realizes that the reason that the stake kills them is because of this blood disease and it causes a hemorrhage and how that, you know, like all the scientific explanations of vampirism or things that we, that was the stuff that I loved as a kid and everything misses that they, uh, you know, as much as I love the Omega man, it's a Jesus allegory. And, uh, you know, I hated the Will Smith one because they made them, you know, monsters. They weren't, uh, you know, the monster is us, the twist, the, like, and again, we were talking about this for a recording. People to us missing the point, and they're the ones making the adaption, we get really put out about. Yeah. But other people are like, yeah, that's it is what it is. Yeah. Although I, one thing, the experience of making Burn Notice actually, it struck me that I think there's a little bit more of an appetite out there than than most TV executives will acknowledge for the wonky stuff. Yeah. Like, how does it work? Right. Because on burn notice, like I spent a lot of time thinking about that stuff. I was, you know, I, like the, the spy craft, the, the, the building of things, like all of that stuff. And the, and and it, it it's not a it's not a model that would support a show getting a sixty share, but you can do pretty well. You know what I mean? Like it was on for seven years. And yeah, did and the people that episode. like it love it. Yeah, the people that like it. So and and like my uncle, huge fan of the show. He was an engineer, right? He wanted to watch it. He wanted to critique it a little bit. He wanted to think about it. All of those things. And I I do think there is an opening for people, but that one of the problems is that. Well, it's two things. I think if you have a technical interest Mm -hmm. or a scientific interest or that kind of thing, you probably didn't become a television executive. Right. Right. It doesn't, it's not a, uh, it's not, or, or a movie executive. It's not a world that particularly rewards those kinds of things right. at the lower levels, it kind of does because there's a lot of reading at the lower right. levels, and they get to figure out st- the problem solving that requires some technical knowledge. Yeah. Usually, but as you climb in that world, if like at a certain point, nobody's reading Scientific American, <laughs> right, right? Right? Nobody right. is like into into that kind of thing, right? And um, and a lot of times, like the personality that is best suited to that is the person who was good at getting the nerds to write the, or, you know, the, like the drama geeks to write the rally for the high school. Right. 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 You know what people will react to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not really like, uh, we know you're writing a play or whatever. Like, I mean, you got your thing, but like, we need a funny skit right. for the, the rally. Can you write that? And, you know, uh, you're flattered and you're like, yeah, all right, it's sure. Yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. And then, and then that becomes like the, the cool thing you did. Like that's, that's what everybody saw. Right. Meanwhile, you're working on your little, your play or whatever. You wouldn't have written that on your own. You wouldn't have written that on your own. And so that, so the, that, that personality is really rewarded. The personality of the person, like the best executives are the people who are like, they're super cool. And when you, you go to their offices, you really feel like the, the cool kids have invited you to sit at their table and eat with them. And then, like, maybe they invite you to their party or whatever. Hey, Matt, do me a favor. Yeah, yeah. From exactly. me. From me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be so, no, and a lot of times it's like, you're so smart. Oh, my God. You're yeah. so funny. This is so great. We could never do this. You're the yeah, best. You're yeah. amazing. And then you do that. And, you know, but, but that kind of personality, like, that guy was not... Doing his own chemistry. Homework. Yeah, they're you know not getting I mean? into the minutiae. Yeah, like I, not. 
I remember my wife thought I was the biggest nerd for this. I went, uh, we were watching the movie The One with Jet Li. Mm-hmm. And it's a movie about parallel universes. And he plays 70 different, uh, you know, string theory versions of himself. And every version, he used a different style of martial arts. Mm. And it's super wonky. And nobody really would have noticed it. But I was like, oh man, this character, because he's from this kind of world, he's using a southern style. Yeah. And this, and I was so excited that this dumb thing that nobody cares about, maybe some people would subtly pick up on it as a character thing that his movements are different or something. But I was so, I was like, this is the best thing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he's using 80 different styles of martial arts depending on the character. And she's just like, you're a nerd. But that's what shows up. I, I think though, I, I, I would argue that there's a, a phenomenon of like nerd like you recognizes that thing and really appreciates that thing. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, like on the gifted, we do, you know, we, there's certainly plenty of like, I know the comic that came from. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yes. Were you a comic reader as a kid? I was, um, when I could be, because okay. again, I lived way out in Palm Springs. There were no comic book stores. Yeah. So basically, it's not a kid friendly area. Yeah, my dad would buy me comics, um, and I would read them, uh, when I could. Right. Newsstand, uh, drugstore. Yeah, newsstand, yeah. yeah. So I was, I was that kind of comic book reader. And then, like, as I got older, I, you know, and, and had more access to them, I, uh, I, I got more interested in them. But I was definitely a superhero guy. I was yeah. like a big fan. So that's uh, so you can put those sort of see the, those little Easter egg things in. Um, oh, but the, for, I guess the thing I was going to say though about that was the that there's a certain kind of person that's going to recognize the Easter eggs, but then there's a much larger set of people that recognizes that there are Easter eggs. That, right. that there's a there and they appreciate that whatever you're doing, you've clearly worked it out. There's a craft. There's a craft, and there's a depth to this. Because they realize that even though they don't have the 10 questions that the true TV nerd would have about it, they have three. Right. And all three of those questions had really immediate and easy answers. And audiences hate it when three, you know, if you get two questions in or three questions in and there's no answer, you're in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, unless you have like a handful of major stars that everybody loves. Or you're David Lynch. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, but actually David Lynch, that's a different kind of thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's doing, he's making moving paintings and people and it is intentionally obtuse about answering things that he has an answer for. I think actually there's a lost and people don't talk about this. And I, I speak as someone who enjoyed lost, but it salted the earth for a lot of other shows by basically saying to an audience that was like, here is a new kind of thing. There are mysteries and there are answers to those mysteries and we are going to go deep and we are going to obsess about these mysteries. And, you know, and they just went, they were so all in. And then the show basically was like, yeah, sorry, there were not answers to those mysteries and there never were. And, there's kind of an answer to like a couple of the mysteries that you really wanted, but guess what? They're not really answers that required you watching the whole show four times and backwards. Yeah. Your answer is probably better than what it was. Yeah. I was, yeah. when, when lost ended, I, I pictured all the people who loved it as being Ralphie in a Christmas story when he gets the decoder <laughs> and he goes a crummy commercial. <laughs> it's, he thinks it's going to be this <laughs> life. Yeah. Yeah. He solves this code and he's like, that's it. And that's kind of how everybody was. But that's, I think there's also a thing there and it's, it's something that, that I've you know been conscious of when you're, when you're writing television or things, I try to stay away from giant blow your mind mysteries. Yeah. Because, and it was actually a thing on Burn Notice, like there was a, I I was constantly in conflict with the marketing people because they were always like, and now the big mystery of who burned Michael Weston. I was like, guys, I answered the question in season one. But answer it again with something different. Yeah. Yeah. And and like, do something that will blow your mind. And and, And I actually took some executives, I walked them through all of the possible options. I was like, because I know you want this, I'm going to tell you all of the things that we could possibly do and why they are all stupid. Yeah. Right. And so we did some things over the years where it was sort of like, Oh, um, so 
someone actually did talk to Michael's father before he died, right. who was involved in the burning, right? right? But so many times, like... I, how many executives were like, Michael's father's alive and he burned him he and burned he's a spy him. master. So many times. Yeah, yeah, so many times. Yeah. And I was like, guys, I've been pitched that on Twitter. Yeah. Like everybody has talked about that. And they think they want that, but they thought of it. It's going to feel like the most obvious thing in the yeah. world. And, and it, it doesn't also make kind sense. of undermines the, it's, it's a pet peeve of mine when you watch spy shows on TV. Um, like in America, we have decided that espionage is a genetic condition yeah. passed from parent to child. James Bond Jr. Yeah, James Bond Jr. <laughs> or like Alias, <laughs> yeah. the family of spies, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And, and it's not. It's the yeah. opposite, yeah. right? It is not that. And so, uh, so yeah, I was... Um, but in terms of like the big kind of mind fuck, the thing that I've just realized when you start doing the math on TV shows and, and, and movies and things, there just aren't that many variations on it. Yeah, and it gets, it, you get a sky's fault. Like, one of the reasons I loved the new Doctor Who, and I had to check out because every season, all of creation is undone and recreated. Like, mm -hmm. the stakes, you had the highest possible stakes last season. Kind of nothing matters now. Right. And then you do it again. And we already, we already saw this. It's eternal torture forever. You eternal know, it's, you, you can't keep doing that. And you, at some point, I feel like you have to have enough confidence in your characters that people are going to like them enough just to see them doing smaller stories. <laughs> well, but there's a thing now, though, where everybody sort of got religion on like, oh, we got to care about the characters, et cetera, et cetera. But there's always this pressure to make the stakes like world shattering and stuff. And I was a huge fan. I mean, the heroes has been dissected 50 Absolutely. ways from Sunday, but my thing, like as someone who really loved the first season of heroes and watched the second season and a good bit of the third season, I, as soon as I saw the first season, I was like, Oh, I love this doomed show because save the cheerleader, save the world, like save the world. Yeah. Okay, next season, That's all it. you can do <laughs> is save the world again Yeah. in a way that has a less pithy, uh, like, uh, slogan, yeah. right? And then the other thing was ordinary people discovering their powers, blah, blah, blah. Okay, if that's what we're watching the show for, you can't have any series regulars. Yep. Yeah. But, I mean, and they've talked about it, like... They didn't want to have series regulars, but they had to. They had to because that's what people that's want. That's what people thought they wanted. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't know if you ever read um, George R. R. Martin did an anthology series in the 80s called Wild Cards. Oh, no. Um, and it was amazing. And I cannot believe with the success of the stuff he's done, no one's optioned this. But the premise was this alien ship uh, blows up over New York in the 40s. And as a result, people mutate. And some people get what they call an ace, which is a superpower. Mm -hmm. Some people get what they call a joker, which is like they're horribly, some of them have powers, but they're mutated and they live in joker towns mm -hmm. and cities and it's like a slum. And then some people died and some people are just fine. And it takes place in the seventies and eighties, you know, 30 years on and what society's like. And it was an anthology series. It was new stories in that world, no returning characters. Oh, wow. And after about the third volume, they started focusing on the same four or five characters and and it's terrible right. because it, the premise was gone. It wasn't ordinary people, um, you know, cause it's such a, that's such a rich premise for a world and you can go anywhere with it that it's like they didn't know what they had. And I'm like, you could do it. And I thought about it. I was like, you could do that as an anthology series, which would essentially be what it sounds like heroes could have been, but I bet they would ruin it four episodes in by having it be the same characters. Well, it's also hard. I mean, there's a whole machine in television where, you know, they want who's the person that's going to go on the talk shows and promote right. it. Who's the, you know, there, there's just a whole machine that wants series regulars that wants it to work a certain way. And it's interesting because you like, you look at this, you know, this list of TV shows that I, you know, they all worked a certain way and there's all of this history that went into how to do shows, how to, you know, and how to market shows and everything. And we were just in the process of blowing all that up. Yeah. And it's interesting because as we blow it up, we're discovering, oh, well, if you blow up this part in the current environment, uh, shows can do great. But if you blow up this part, no, you're done. Yeah. And I, and we'll, we'll get your list in a second. I don't want to keep you all day because I could talk forever. But, um, one of the things that I always point out is that 
in the early days of television and movies, everyone who worked in that world had lives before that. They came from somewhere else. That's true. They came from the ad world. They came from radio. They came from totally unrelated fields. And they brought things they knew from those to that world. Right. And now you have people raised on third, fourth, fifth generation removed from that. So we're starting to blow those things up without having the other sort of experience yeah, yeah, yeah. of other jobs to kind of inform those decisions in a lot of ways. So that's really, I think that's really perceptive. And all, but also like we're the flip side of that is, you know, at the same time, some of the power of, of current television, you know, the golden age stuff comes from the fact that today's television writers grew up watching tons of television yeah. and, and were able to learn a lot of the narrative lessons uh, of other TV shows and, and and aspire to to do that, but at the same time, yeah, they don't they don't know uh, they don't know the, the the life lessons you know that right. grew up on TV. So they can play with those cliches and go against them and stuff. But also, we we lose some actors too that had like Eddie Albert's always the guy mm-hmm. that I talk about was so funny but he was a world war ii hero he saved a whole battalion of people on a ship and this sounds stupid but he brings that to green acres like he has this seething rage of a guy who's trying to do the right thing because he had lived a life you know well for brimley you know um guys like that where we have great actors now but they don't necessarily to me read that experience of a different life they had i think i think there's part of it also though is once upon a time i was talking to sharon glass about this recently she was talking about being brought in as a contract player Mm -hmm. and that kind of thing and i think there was once upon a time when the studios were more powerful and and that was how the world worked and to some extent like they would just sort of identify someone and say, like, okay, you, right, we're going to train you up. You may or may not be a star, but we're going to train you. We're going to give you – you'll be able to eat, right? right? And, and then you could find someone with an interesting background who had a good look, who, you know, the whole thing, and you could, you could keep them in the system. But the, the thing now is, uh, you know, fortunately and unfortunately, to do that job requires such a singular passion. Yeah. Right, that it's it's really hard to to support, and also I think unfortunately, and I I think this trend is accelerating in a bad way. It's very hard now to make a living as a middle class actor, and and all of the the guest stars. You know, I explained that when people talk to me about wanting to be an actor, I'll be like, okay, well, let's just do the math. Okay, let's say you did five guest stars on a show in a year, which is a lot. Right. And like you're <laughs> now you're the most successful of your friends probably. And like, we're just going to go through the math. Now the once upon a time, five guest stars in a year, you could ask for more than scale or more than top of show. You could ask for all of these things, but now I don't know, maybe you made $40,000 after your agents and managers and lawyers and everything. And like, Maybe you'll see some residuals with that, but maybe you won't. Yeah, or right? there'll be two cents. Or, maybe it'll yeah. be canceled or whatever it is. And so that that didn't used to be the case. And so now you just see a lot more people who need like big side hustles, need to be independently wealthy, that kind of thing. And certainly there were terrible aspects of the old studio system, but right. at least there you could just say like, okay, well, I'm an actor. chosen who we're hiring and, you know, they're yeah. going to stay, you know, they're going to stay on TV. And it's weird too. Like so many of the people that I've befriended over the years that have actors and, you know, as people get older, it's harder for them to find work, especially women who are still just as good or hilarious or talented. It's so hard to have been in high profile things to your average person who thinks, well, they're loaded. I saw them in a movie and it's like, Maybe I paid a lot for that, but then I couldn't get a job for three years. Yeah. So it averaged out that I made less than you make. Right. And people also treat you now like you're an asshole because you're in a movie. And so it makes, you know, and if, if you've been acting for 10 years and then you try to go get a job as a receptionist or something, people are like, yeah, what are you doing? I'm doing this. So it's, it's a weird curse. Sort I think of. people who want to do it should be forced to watch better things. Yeah. Um, just to see like, that's what success, like big success. That's what that looks like. Yeah. Right. For most people, 
like that is that's what you're that's the dream it's like a that's hustle. a person who's making like a really nice living living in a cool house in los Feliz. like that's what actors look like don't watch entourage right there's like four of those guys yeah right and everyone hates them and everyone hates them and their <laughs> yeah. lives aren't really like that yeah. and blah, blah blah like don't watch that yeah you know it's a uh because like it's just it's cool you know what i mean like that uh, uh, I'd, I'd say you know uh, like living in a cool house in Los Feliz and working regularly. That's, that's, that's pretty not, good. That's a, that's a great life. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's not like you don't get an entourage. You're not no. flying around in private planes. You know, it's just, it's a, it's a cool thing. It's having a good job, yeah. like a decent job, like any job. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that's how you're going to live. And that's good. It's a comfort level. That's yeah. the difficult thing. If you can work in the entertainment industry without having to constantly hustle. There's yeah. still some hustle, but you're not every day like, oh man, how am I going to make some money today? You're you're succeeding. <laughs> Actually, one thing though that I talk to a lot of people and I talk to actors about. I was talking to Garrett Dillahunt about this, um, but it's true for me. It's true for a lot of writers. Like you get to a certain level, right? And you intellectually know that you can work. You're probably mm-hmm. okay, but. You didn't get there by, by feeling that or thinking that, right? So your attitude is still, I want all the jobs all the time. I have to be doing something. I mean, the reason I'm here is that for the first time in 17 years, I hadn't taken more than a week off in 17 years. And you could have, right? I could have, but yeah, like I was, you know, a vacation for me. Like when I went to Mexico to a resort in Mexico with my family, my vacation was writing for four hours a day. Yeah. Right. And then I go and hang out on the beach with my kids. Yeah. Right. Because that, that's the thing. And I'm not like kicking back now. It's really just, I know I have a second season. This season was all consuming. My, my kids were mad at me because I never saw them. And <laughs> right. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just take like the month off. But. I have not taken a month off in, in a bazillion years. Now yeah. I'm saying that and it's like, you know, most of America and, and 99% of the world is like, you're taking a fucking month off. Yeah. Like cry me a But you but, work. Yeah. I mean, like I, like when I come out here, I'm doing three, four episodes a day of the show and people are like, I thought you're on vacation. I'm like, I am. Uh, yeah, yeah, I love exactly. doing it. Yeah, you know, so. it's nice out. It's I'm not snowy. It's yeah. yeah. But I'm, I'm busy. If I'm just sitting around, I'm like, Oh my God, I'm, there's things I'm not doing that I should be doing. I'm the like, yeah, I'm so the lazy. I'm missing all these opportunities. <laughs> uh, so not again, I, I would take your whole day and I apologize, but let's look at some of the highlights oh, yeah, you have yeah. here. So uh, this is Wonder Woman. The first thing you have well, here, here were the things that I, I, so Wonder Woman was just the first show on the list that I on, in the TV guide that I watched. Yeah, um, and it was uh, it was really sort of like I would watch it if nothing else was on. Even at the time, I was like, "It's it's a it's a rope. They're yeah. just putting a rope around that person. This is not a special effect. This is like she should fight more." Yeah, and she was she was attractive, but I was not. I was pretty young, so I was sort of not like that into that. But that was. It was, uh, I just was, I wrote it down because I was like, oh, yes, I actually watched a fair amount of one. Yeah. And I just didn't think about it. And that show threw me off as a kid, too, because it switched networks. And when it switched networks, they went from it being a period piece set in World War II to all of a sudden being set in the 70s with no explanation. Oh, I actually only really watched the 70s now that you mention yeah. it. Yeah. That's, in syndication, that's they didn't rerun the first season very much because it didn't fit. But it's all set in World War II, yeah. full period piece. And it was so weird to be like, wait, wait what? what's happened now? But they, they, they used to do things like that more because you had fewer options and, and occasionally a network could just look you in the eye and be like, yep. Yep. Darren is a different actor now. And you couldn't necessarily like TV guide was the only thing we had to prove that these things happened. Right. Like they were like, like, no, it was a different guy. And they're like, I don't think so. I'm watching it now. And he's yeah. that guy. Cause you couldn't go back and review it. Like there were probably people in school where kids were like, it used to be in world war two. And kids were like, you're a liar. What are you talking? <laughs> There's yeah, no way. No, that I was in there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, um, so yeah, I did not watch a ton of that. Um, Gilligan's Island. I watched a fair amount of, it was really too silly for me. But I still watched it because it was on. And it was also one of those cultural things where yeah. you kind of needed to to watch it. But it's funny. Like, looking back, that is an example of, I feel like 
America's sense of humor. We just kind of grew up a little bit like you couldn't really do the Harlem Globetrotters right, with robots, like mess up the robots, <laughs> like on an island with coconuts. Like if you did it, it would be an Adult Swim, yeah. surreal, sort of winking, uh, ironic way. Right. You couldn't sincerely do that as a show now. Yeah, and I could never show it to my children because. <laughs> They would be like, you guys suck. Yeah. Like, what was wrong with yeah, you? You guys were, your heads were broken. Yeah. I uh-huh. mean, at the same time, though, I'll watch a show like Green Acres, which superficially seems silly, like, um, like Gilligan's Island, but is actually really subversive and smart and weird and surreal. And there's that famous episode where the credits are on, written on actual things. Oh, I didn't and, see that. Oh, wow. And Ava Gabor's commenting on them. Oh, wow. And there's an episode where Arnold Ziffel the pig gets drafted into the Vietnam War. Mm. And just these, these things that they were, they knew what they were doing and really breaking the fourth wall and doing weird stuff on this show that people just wouldn't ever expect. You just sort of get away with it. That's, yeah. I, I got to look that up. That's, that's it's fascinating. really good. Yeah, it's great. So, the one, a couple that stood out to me just as I was looking at it were um, Barney Miller. Again, yep. I had the same observation that you did, which was, "Oh wow, this is a this is a show for adults that I watched a ton of." Yeah, and I don't know why I liked watching cops do paperwork, Talk but I guess it, it yeah. was it was it was well written. But I, I actually did appreciate, even at the time, the form breaking element of. They're not out there busting heads. It, this feels like a more realistic portrayal of what this. Yeah. Oh, actually, one thing that this just popped into my head. A lot of times, you know, Mad Magazine would do parodies of shows. Yes. And a lot of times I would get the kind of meta conceit of a show by reading the Mad Magazine parody of it. Same. And so, yeah, Barney Miller was a thing where I remember I actually didn't really get it until I read the Barney Miller parody and they talked about it, and um, I can still remember the panels from the yeah. Bernie Miller where they, they where they kind of made fun of the show for not showing any of the like scene shooting. Yeah, yeah. Like, there was no drug addict. There yep. were no drug addicts on the show. That kind of thing. And so there was a big panel where they introduced all of these really seedy, horrible, actual New York it. crime. Yeah, yeah I, it's funny. So many people. Mad Magazine and Looney Tunes mm-hmm. gave us this huge education on popular culture from the previous 50 years that as kids, we just shouldn't have had yeah. any knowledge of. Yeah. And we just absorbed it. I can tell you who invented the pill because of Mad Magazine. Because I went to my dad and I was like, in the Star Trek parody, <laughs> they go to planet Pincus. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it called Pincus? And he was like, okay, well, there was a scientist who invented the pill. His last name was Pincus. And like, and I was like, oh, okay. okay. It's That's funnier. important. Well, it's funnier. And it's also like, it made you feel so sophisticated yeah. to get it. And, and that's, and Mad Magazine has, they don't do that anymore. There's no, no like aiming at the. It's it, I, the parody. You have to generally, not always have an affinity for the thing you're parodying or understand it. And I feel like now that doesn't happen as much. It ends up being the superficial stuff or it's a little bit too mean spirited and not in like a ball busting siblings kind of way. And Mad Magazine always used to be that way. Right. It was, you know, I love Barney Miller. So here's, I'm good at going to do the parody on it. Yeah. They, they got what made it tick so they could deconstruct it. Yeah. And the deconstructing, and that was a, that served a really valuable purpose for any like TV or movie nerd because you would see the thing deconstructed and realize like, oh, this has moving parts. Someone assembled this, which is how they in a, in a five page spread, how they can tell the whole story of a Star Trek or how right. they can tell the whole story of a Dukes of Hazard. Okay. It has because there are, there are structures within it. And yeah, to like young writers revealing internal structure was this really valuable service. And it was, you know, you're not watching a VHS of it. Mm -hmm. You have the physical Mad Magazine. You can pour over it. it You can go at your pace. You can look at it over and over again. And that was another thing for me for story with comics because, you know, especially the old ECs, which were more traditional sort of storytelling way. Um, you you could take your pace to right. learn story structure and had the ability to reread it, which you couldn't necessarily do with TV shows. Yeah, and I also think it's it's interesting though, like comics, because I think a lot about comics now. 
the there there's this divide as comics sort of turned in on itself where once upon a time a comic would be like pick it up you know read it you don't you miss a few uh, issues maybe you read religiously but there's like kind of a self-contained deal right and, like a soap opera yeah soap opera that kind of thing and then and and once you got into total self-referentiality and retconning and everything it became i think much better for the dedicated fan because there was this sense of ownership and right. knowing something you and it was an exclusive this. club yeah it was hard and you did it and i totally get that but it makes it much harder to penetrate for the casual fan right and so i always find i have to kind of balance you know in thinking about uh it, like what we try to do on the gifted is is basically here's uh, here's something that you do not need to ever have read a comic to understand. If you have read a comic, yes, this is what we're doing. It's better. Right. It, yeah. You or know, you, you know, where it differently. Came from. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was always the difference between Marvel and DC and that DC, which a lot of kids didn't like for this reason, had archetypal characters that you got right away. Right. Killed by, his parents got killed. He's a vigilante at night. Alien superpowers. And then that's all you needed to know. And the story, worked. Right. Whereas Marvel, and one of the things that was their success, was they were tied to continuity so much. Mm -hmm. You were invested in the problems in the day-to-day, -day, and that was the major difference. And then that Marvel sort of method is sort of seeped into all comics now. Um, but I always, like, not to get on a tangent, but one of the reasons I hated Watchmen, the movie, was because it looked correct in that they basically used the comic as storyboards. But the thing that made the Watchmen comic work so well was that it realized that the unique combination of stories and of words and pictures that is a comic book is a different storytelling style, mm -hmm. unique in and of itself. And it exploited that in a way that doesn't work in a direct translation. Yeah. You would have to change it to fit the new format. So, which they didn't do. So it kind yeah, of no, missed I, a lot of the stuff. I totally agree. And, and that's, have you ever read Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, that, like the, the whole sort of inter panel storytelling, the filling in is, is the essence of that. And if you don't do that in a, if you don't fill in the, in between the panels in a movie, then you're not doing it. Yeah. And it's also why in some of the, 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 in thinking about some of the, the Marvel, like w when it got very interesting continuity, it became impossible for the casual reader right. to fill in what the story between the, the panels, because what you were supposed to fill it in with was all the history right. that you may or may not know, you know? Yeah. It's like he's dropping on people you don't know at a restaurant. Yeah, it might exactly. be an interesting yeah. conversation, but if you don't know, you know, Aunt Violet, it didn't know what she's like and what she's been through. And if you did know Aunt Violet, it was so great. Yeah, yeah, it exactly. Was amazing. Exactly. But yeah, you don't, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a tough it, balance. It's a tough balance, but it's also, it, it's a thing that, that I think, like in thinking about old TV and stuff, it's one of the things that we're going to be sort of grappling with in a, in, a, in storytelling culture, um, coming up which is there's all this stuff that is great if you understand what it's built on right and is incomprehensible if you don't understand what it's built on so like the sort of cringe comedy sitcoms right to some extent stand on the shoulders of conventional sitcoms mm -hmm. And if you understand how a conventional sitcom would work, if you grew up on a certain kind of conventional sitcom and then you watch a Curb Your Enthusiasm, you get what they're doing and you understand it. But if you don't, if you're not steeped in it in the same way, then it just looks like a bunch of people you don't like being mean it's to each other. It's a bunch of assholes. Yeah. yeah. And that's been the, the cringe sort of standard mm -hmm. has been almost the standard for 20 years now. And so it's, I'm curious to see what the next generation of people making stuff playing off a standard that played off the standard we grew up with yes. is. And I don't know what that will be, but I'm curious to see what it ends up being. Because well, I, Yeah, I just, I look at my kids and I'm like, I don't know where you go from Rick and Morty and Adventure Time. Yeah. I, like, you go somewhere, you're going to make something. Yeah. But I could see... 
I could see that going a number of ways. I mean, obviously, it could go more and more psychedelic, but I don't know how much more psychedelic you can go. Yeah, there. Adventure That's Time, fine. I love. And Adventure Time, Adventure Time made me feel confident that the future would be okay because I watched that show and I said, the kids who love this show now are going to find each other as adults yes. and make great stuff. And they're going to be, there were shows that I feel like made us better people. And some of the Norman Lear stuff with like Twilight Zone, um, stuff that Henson did when he was still running the company, that, that sort of allegory and that sort of message, which was essentially don't be an asshole, right. made us better people, uh, the people that watched them. Actually, you want to know, this is crazy. My, <laughs> this, this is totally unrelated to that exactly, but it's still a thing. My youngest son, when he was little, um, uh, he accidentally set his shirt on fire. And I, I, I heard him screaming, and I, I ran in, and his shirt was on fire, and he was patting out the fire on his shirt. And he was burned. Like, we yeah. took him to the hospital. I mean, he's okay now, but, like, he had a scar. He had some scars for years, right? Uh, again, not horrible, but... Um, the in the emergency room, uh, we were talking about like it's a slightly. It, it, he was also talking to his brother about this, but basically they were like, "Yeah, most kids try to take their shirts off, right, and they end up with a Burn burning shirt caught around their face." And so he's incredibly lucky. Like he just patted it out, and and uh, and what came up was he'd seen on Adventure Time someone patting out a burning thing. And so when he caught on fire, he did the thing that they did in Adventure Time and it saved him from being horribly burned all over his face. Yes. And I was yeah. like, all right, I love you, Adventure Thanks, Time. Thanks, Adventure Time. You can watch all the Adventure Time you want. <laughs> Anything else that might come up, you now know. But I mean, that's... But there is an essential decency <laughs> yeah. at the heart of Adventure Time that... I think is really important. And weirdly, there's an essential decency at the heart of Rick and Morty, which I think, you know, Dan Harmon has been grappling with the, 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 the strain in his audience that refuses to recognize the essential decency and yeah. only recognizes that there's a, that the assholery that's supposed to highlight the yeah. essential decency. And, and it's sort of like, all right, well now it's just like, uh, uh, you need a heart. You can't have a, a shock vicious machine. string on Reddit. Yeah. And that actually, uh, just looking at this list, one thing that I, I was thinking about was the Waltons. And I was thinking, I, I'm thinking a lot about the Waltons because it wasn't, I would watch it. My parents liked it more, but um, the, uh, I think it was a rerun on Friday. Um, but my parents would watch it and I would watch, watch it. And it, what I wonder is, in this time, I think there's an opening for a show like The Waltons or Little House on the Prairie. Like a sweet family show? Just something that based, but more than sweet, it's basically, I think right now, America, and I don't like, I'm, I'm doing a show already, so somebody else can do this. <laughs> but the, the, I think that it's, there, there's an appetite for someone who gently and self-assuredly does the right thing in challenging circumstances and is gentle and decent and strong. And that, I think, is a, you know, and without getting too much into why we might want that right yeah. now, but I do think that that is an archetype that especially right now has an obvious appeal to the right because it's probably a strong father or a strong mother. Yeah. Right. It's a family and it's structure. A, and it's some sort of authority figure. Right. But it also has a strong appeal on the left, which is clearly craving decency, uh, decency <laughs> yeah. and kind of yeah. like that kind of thing. I on, a, think on a sort of micro selflessness yes because because when we get that now it's like he jumped in front of a bullet and that's not no. what we need we need well this is kind of a pain for me but it's making your life better here right. those kinds of smaller gestures that we don't see in things that yeah we're in these shows like this episode of the waltons jim bob returns from the service to what he expects will be a life of ease and mamie and emily stumble onto the secret room where their grandfather brewed his recipe mm -hmm. <laughs> like there's no real it's plot a small there. Small story, yeah. yeah, and and and, but it's it's essentially about family relationships that that reinforce a sense of security and and that kind of thing. And and that's that show. 
uh, it represented something to me. Uh, and I think a lot about that. Like the Mary Tyler Moore show was before yeah. my time, but I remember my parents watching it and laughing. And I remember thinking when I was like two or three, I want to know what's funny. And I would right. go to them and I'd be like, what was funny? And they'd be right. like, it's hard to explain. Honey. Yeah. It's not, there was explain no VCR. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Please tell me what was funny. Yeah. And, uh, and they couldn't, but that hunger to know what was funny and to that, that like, to, t- to try to do the sophisticated, to try to understand the sophistication. The other one that struck me was uh, Sanford and Son. Right. Um, which I watched a fair amount of, and I was aware that it was a window into another part of America. Very much so. <laughs> and, and I was also aware that, like, it was interesting. I, I would watch Sanford and Son as sort of like a uh, an anthropological right. exploration where I'd be like, okay, I get why that was funny. The one guy doesn't like the other guy, and he says the mean things, but I guess they love each other. You know, like, right. And that, that, I think, is a... It's a... It's interesting to think, like... What are the shows that now where you're really looking at a world that is not your own or that actually is anyone's yeah. like that's or the, that, uh, yeah, absolutely. One of the things I always complain about is sort of, and I know there's been blue collar shows after this, but Roseanne, even though it's back being one of sort of the last true blue collar shows in that, that family had a natural gallows humor because their life was horrible in a lot of ways. They were losing their job. They would lose the house and, you know, they would bust each other's balls. But then if someone from the outside did it, they would come again. Like it had that real sense of heart. And when I think executives figured out that tweens existed right. and teenage girls existed, TV became sort of bifurcated in that it was all of a sudden all aspirational mm-hmm. um, or all laughing at in yeah. that you're either laughing at rich people who you want to see get it or dumb, you know, honey boo boo, poor people that you want to see get it. And it, and we get very little of that actual reflection of real people's struggles, but maybe it's hard to sell things. I don't know. I think there, it's a combination of things. Um, but I think one thing that is hard to discount is, you know, it's very hard to be a television executive. I bet. Right. It's very like your life is I, when a, like the, the, a friend of mine became the president of Fox and he's not the president of Fox anymore, but when he's president of AMC, but when he got the job of president of Fox, um, I basic I called him up and I was like, Hey, so how's the iron throne? I yeah. it's sharp. And he's like, yeah, it is. You're gambling you know? with other people's money. Yeah. And, <laughs> but the thing, the thing that, people don't realize sometimes is um, that when you're buying a TV show, the, the one of the things that you're very conscious of is most TV shows are going to fail. Yeah. Right. And that's just the way it is. And so the question that will be asked of you, right. Is essentially what did you do to avoid this? Right. right. What did you, did you, ha- did you place the best bet? Right. Right. And you, you can look people in the eye and say, I wanted to, th- I thought that there was a possibility that casting less attractive people who were more reflective of the reality, you know, and of, of people's lives right. and putting them in a sort of a dumpy set and, and basically, and reducing the number of jokes per minute so it it has a more sort of natural cadence and a relatability. I made a gamble that all of those things would work, right? But you will get fired for that if yeah. it doesn't succeed. If it does succeed, you'll be a genius. But yeah. if it doesn't succeed, you're an idiot, yeah. right? Whereas take that same show, right? And do the sort of schlubby guy. Hot wife. Hot <laughs> wife, right? Why do you do that? Well... You can't get blamed for hiring a really successful comedian. Yeah. Right? You, that, he can't, you can't lose. There's right? four other shows on right now that are doing well like that. Exactly. Yeah. You can't get blamed for putting on the hot wife, right? Like, she's super attractive. She tested well, all of those things. And you just go down the list, right? 
And the problem is you can't get blamed for doing things that people are already doing successfully. Right. Right. But it's very hard to, to really hit in a big way if you're doing the things that people are already doing successfully. It's hard to innovate. Like some of my favorite shows were ended up being bait and switches that were clearly in the wake of a successful show. Mm -hmm. So the uh, famous Teddy Z is a good example that Hugh Wilson did after him, mm -hmm. uh, WKRP. He wanted to make a show about old guys in Hollywood. They're not going to make that show. Right. So he pitched it as John Cryer is a mailroom boy and he gets an agent job for a Marlon Brando type. And then by episode three, John Cryer is almost not in the show at all. Mm -hmm. And it's a show about Alex Rocco. You're not going to sell a sitcom in 1989 about Alex Rocco. And it ended up failing, but it won an Emmy. Um, or like when you had Twin Peaks was very popular. So we started getting weirdness and we got Picket Fences. Right. And Picket Fences, which was an amazing show. Um, I think it was David E. Kelly. Um, started as a Twin Peaks ripoff. It was about a murder in a small well, town. And the premise was it's murder in a quirky small town and the head doctor and the policeman are married. Mm -hmm. But then a couple episodes in, they make the show they kind of wanted to make. So yeah. it's a weird thing where it yeah, was Northern exposure yeah. is a, is a single lead fish out of water comedy that became an ensemble dramedy yeah. Over time. And yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. And I think you're right. It does take though, it, th when you look at like what succeeds in a big way, a lot of times you end up with either, uh, like a showrunner creator who like has the sophistication to do that. Right. Right. And the power. Right. Right. Because you need to be able to push back because it's not like they didn't figure out that it was about the old guys at yeah. a certain point. You know yeah. I mean? It did. And so you, you have to either be like this canny old wolf, right? right? Or you have to be the clueless young thing right. that doesn't realize what you're know. doing. Yeah. yeah. And you come in and you, uh, and you change the form and, and that kind of thing. And so, uh, it's, but it's hard, like, to do. It's a lot of politics at play there. Politics, yeah. yeah. And people, people don't realize quite how deeply political the job is. And how, I mean, one of the things that I was doing all year on The Gifted was, you know, with a lot of voices, everybody's smart. A lot of their notes conflict. It's hard to do. Like, everybody's worried. All of those things. And then, really, the only political way out of it is just write a new script. Yeah. Right? Just, okay, yeah, like, I get it. You guys have all these notes. Can we just, I'm just going to take this note. You didn't like it. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to just do a new, we'll do a new Start one. Start completely right? over. And, yeah. and I'm going to sort of like acknowledge all of these notes that you gave. And like, I'm going to give somebody everything. Everybody's going to get something. And at the end of the day, I'm going to give you a script. I like the script. You guys, will, I hope you guys will like the script, but they usually did like the script and it resolved all of the political conflicts. Right. Nobody had to win. Nobody had to lose. Right. Everybody got it's something. It's like writing a congressional script. bill. Yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and so you do that and then it works and, um, and, and then you can move on. But, you know, as a, as a showrunner, you have to sort of get your head around. Yeah. I know. I like the first script. We can't do that. Yeah. We're not doing it. And the longer I mourn it or the longer I fight for it or whatever, I'll just recycle all those ideas for a different episode or yeah. something like that. But for right now, I'm just going to give them a new thing because because they've all got jobs on the line. And yeah. stuff like that. You got to pick your battles, yeah. know when to what what hill to die on sort yeah. of. Yeah, it's there's a side note. There's an amazing episode of the famous Teddy Z where the network buys a show from these documentarians who are making a documentary series about like Sandinistas. And by the end of the show, it ends up being a show about a girl in a tube top with a talking porpoise. <laughs> but the show's so well written, it makes perfect sense wow. how this gets from A to B. Because like each person goes, ah, oh, can we change this? No, like, yeah, sure. And it's so perfect. Wow. I don't know if Hollywood actually works like that, but I'd like to think that's pretty accurate. And it's, it, it's so well done that you're just like, I buy it. That, mm -hmm. that's what it started as. And it, Ended up as that somehow. Well, the analogy <laughs> I always use is is a lot of times the way it works is somebody says, "Hey, can you build me a car?" And they have an idea of what you want of of, of what they they want. And you know, let's say it's a, a BMW five series. Right. So you build the BMW five series, and then they're like, "Okay, well, it's cool, but it does not have the fuel economy of this Prius that I saw." Right. 
And then another person says, and, and I'd like it to, which in the abstract, I get it. It would be great. Yeah. You know? And then another executive says, I was at this monster truck rally the other day <laughs> and like these huge knobbly tires on these trucks, I can drive over anything. It looks amazing. Each piece, like, and as you go down that road, each piece is perfectly logical. Yes. And there might even be a great reason why, like, huge knobbly tires would be useful for this. You know, like, we're going to need to drive yeah, over some We could justify that. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> and then, and, and obviously, fuel economy is always good, right? And so, then you start building a, you, you put in the Prius engine and you put in the hybrid thing, but it wasn't really built for that, so it doesn't really fit. So, you don't get quite the fuel economy that the Prius had, or even close, really. And then you put on the big knobbly, t- knobbly tires, but it's not actually built for that. And eventually, you get this thing where... And, and that's what people don't realize. What people don't realize is individually, yes, you get stupid notes, but the problem isn't that they're stupid. The problem is that they're smart. Yeah. The problem is that they're often right. The problem is that like they've identified a real problem, which is this car needs to drive over rocks. The best I can do right now is saying is to say big knobbly tires will help it drive over rocks. They're right. Right. This car needs better fuel efficiency. They're right. Right. The problem is those things don't go together. Right. right. Their, their solution isn't appropriate, although their problem may be correct. They've identified yeah. something real. And so, and, and, and the answer ultimately may be, and, and oftentimes it'll also be just something, I mean, to, to leave the analogy for a second, it'll be something like, yeah, that's cool. The thing you did, but that's not what we air. Right. Like that's not, that doesn't go on our network. Yeah. Like long story but once upon a time i tried to do sort of a non anti-hero show for fx when they were deep into that mm-hmm. and they don't do that they right. don't do heroes right and and so like i can't argue with them yeah. and i could i tried to be like okay maybe he's an anti-hero but it wasn't that show it's not that show right and so that was why i i discovered and it's been the only tool that like the only tool, because it's just so such hard work that tends to consistently work, is just write a new thing. Because yeah, you, you wrote a, you made a BMW five series. It's not going to work, right? So build a monster truck, and you know, explain to the person that wanted really good fuel economy that you'll do something else for them. Right? You know what I mean? They also wanted really shiny chrome wheels or, or yeah. fenders or something. It'd be like, I'm going to give you the fenders. I can't give you the thing. I'm just doing this. Yeah. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. And it's going to be yours. And I'm going to put like, I'm going to let everybody know that those awesome bumpers, all your yours. idea, yep. right? You it's asked for it. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm going to put it together and then you build something that works. Right. Yeah. And, and hopefully it goes, but if you don't do that, then you're kind of screwed. Yeah. I mean, I've, I'm very, very, inexperienced in pitching stuff but when i have uh they've had me write the show and then been like this is great this is too good for us or this is too ambitious or they said our favorite show on our network is this show we want more shows like that Mm -hmm. and i've pitched them something like we love that and you write it and they go it's too much like that thing we liked and it's like but that's why you told me to write it so it's it is difficult it's like it's like dating the most fickle person ever. There's a lot of like, well, if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. But the thing is, you, you, the, the, the real answer there is never listen to them. Right. Right. Not because they're stupid or not, but it's really the issue is they don't, um, they don't know. Right. And they, they want to be helpful to people. They right. want them to bring them things that they want. But the only note that I ever hear now is we don't like it. Right. right. Because anything else, like, um, basically, they're lying. Yeah. They're not, they don't, they just don't like it. You know right. what I mean? They're looking for an excuse for not liking it. And the other thing is, if you chase that, you could also run smack dab into, like, one time I got a, an, I had a show bought and then unbought, right? Basically, kind of before we could finish the paperwork and the contracts and the whole, basically, like they, they just sort of stepped away from it and gave me a reason that was completely addressable. Right. Right. And there was some talk about trying to address it. And then I was like, no, we're not going to address it because what they're saying 
they're lying. Yeah. They're not, they don't want to tell me the truth. Yeah. When I, and they're not lying because they're mean or evil or anything like that. They're just lying because they don't want to tell me the truth. Yeah. I get it. So I'm not going to do it. And we're going to figure out later what it was. Yeah. And the answer was somebody else already had the basic, the same basic idea and they wanted to do that one more. So there was nothing you could have done. There was nothing yeah. you could have done. And if I chased their note or whatever, you'd be spinning your that wheels. I'd be spinning my wheels. And so that's, I always tell actors, if you get the part, it means you got the part. It doesn't yeah. mean that you were the favorite. It doesn't mean anything. Like, maybe they didn't like you. Who knows? Yeah. There's no, maybe you're the only one who was available. <laughs> yeah. You will never know. Don't right? reverse engineer it because you're not even going to be able to utilize that information to get other things like that. Exactly. Almost, yeah. and if you didn't get the part, maybe you were the absolute best, but like, you look too much like somebody else. Yeah. Or like their ex-girlfriend and it made them uncomfortable. Or, yeah. yeah you who have knows? no way of knowing. Yeah. And so the only thing you can do is kind of do your thing, hope for the best. <laughs> right. Like that kind of thing and just kind of move on if it doesn't work. And if your thing is awesome, like my first screenplay, the screenplay that made me kind of, you know, broke me in Hollywood. First time it was read by the producer and director who were I wrote as a spec, but there was a producer and director attached, like basically sort of encouraging, but deeply unenthusiastic, <laughs> right. right? Like just nice, cool, yeah. a lot of good stuff in there. Just, we're kind of going to do our own thing. You know, I ended up off the project. It was, you know, movie eventually fell apart and the, uh, and then like a year and change later, one of the producers reread it and was like, what did you do to that? <laughs> right. This is a, you, like, it's amazing. Yeah. Right. You really fixed you this. You really fixed this. It was, and I had done zero things. Right. I, it was literally, I printed it out again. Right. <laughs> Different font. Different, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, and that script was, was the, the script that made me. And so that's, it, it was a good lesson for me. Like, Oh yeah. If, if it, and actually, The Good Guys was originally written as a feature that, like, long story, but basically had been passed on, et cetera. And then, but I was always like, but I like this. Yeah. It could work it somehow. Could work. I don't yeah. know. And then, like, you know, five years later, they're like, okay, it's a TV show now. I'm like, great. It's a TV show. I love it. Yeah. Right? But that that phenomenon, you, you just never know. You Sometimes you can blame the audience. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. your fate is not in your hands. And it's there's factors socially or externally that people aren't ready for a thing or it's not the right time, right place. And it's not all, it's not always your fault. Yeah. It's not that they're dumb. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, it's eh, not the right time for this. And right. I believe in it and blah, blah, blah. It'll come around or it won't. And you'll be proved wrong. I mean, there yeah. are other things that I wrote that are always like, ah, I crushed it. And I read it later. I'm like, we did not <laughs> was I thinking it. there? Oh <laughs> boy. <laughs> well, thank you so much for doing this. It's thank been you. great talking to you. And I, I really am uh, excited to have you on the show. This was fascinating. Thank cool. you. So thank you. You're welcome. There you go. That's Matt Nix, one of the smartest people I know, certainly one of the most talented. I uh, cannot thank him enough for taking the time out of his incredibly busy schedule during his one month off that he's had in 17 years to sit down and talk to me about television. And as I said before, I'm a huge fan of his work. So if for some strange reason you're unfamiliar with uh, Burn Notice or The Good Guys or The Comedians uh, or The Gifted, definitely check them out, especially Burn Notice. That's one of my all time favorites. It's an excellent, excellent show. Uh, I think the dogs are calm now, so uh, hopefully they will remain quiet quiet for the remainder of this outro, but uh, if they don't, you know, hey, that's there's three of them, and I'm sitting in a chair recording, and it's hard to manage. Uh, I will say, I don't know how people have children, but anyway, I mean, I know how they make children and, and how they're actually born. I just don't understand how they raise them. Anyway, uh, thank you guys so much for listening. I have more great episodes coming up from my trip to LA. That is all thanks to you, and I, I thank you again for giving to the Patreon for those have ha who have, uh, even if you haven't, thank Thanks for listening. But uh, that is a direct result of this LA trip was a direct result of, of your contributions to the Patreon. So thank you so much. Uh, if you want to contribute, you can go to Patreon backslash patreon.com backslash TV guidance counselor, but not necessary at all. You still get to hear the episodes. Uh, if you want to email me, you can do so at TV guidance counselor at gmail.com or at Ken at I can read.com. I can read.com. Of course, 
being my stand-up comedy page, as I am a stand-up comedian. Uh, I have a show tonight, actually, at the Shaskeen up in Manchester, New Hampshire. If you are a New Englander, you can come see me do stand-up. And tomorrow at the Winchester Library, I'm actually doing a talk about this day in television history. So that'll be uh, February 1st, we'll be looking at uh, throughout the years. So come by that. Uh, it's free if you are in the area, but if in not the immediate future, there's plenty of things coming up. So you can check that out on iCanRead.com. You can also read all about what I'm doing, uh, and you can buy stand up comedy albums and TV guidance council merchandise, but you don't have to do any of those things. You can tweet to us at TV guidance. We're on Instagram at TV guidance or search TV guidance council on Insta on a, not on Instagram. You can, uh, on Facebook, and you can like the page there and talk to other listeners of the show. If you heard this on iTunes and you want to take a minute to rate and review the show, that is a huge help. Uh, or anywhere you heard the show, tell a friend. Uh, it is a word of mouth show. And uh, we'll be here next Wednesday with a brand new episode. Will it be an LA episode? I don't know. We'll have to see. But it'll be brand new. So we'll see you next time on TV Guidance Counselor. <laughs> My response to that is awesome. Can we have lunch so that I can eat your heart and steal your power?